Um, hello, welcome to Office Hours. I wanted to start by answering the question on everyone's mind, which is, are the dogs in the office? This week they are, as it happens. My wife is uh, out of town. They really prefer to be in with her, but when she's gone, they'll settle for me. That's um, Frazier in the chair. He's got his spring haircut, so uh, he's looking a little... Uh, a little more doggy, I think, a little doggier than when he's fluffier. Um, and then there is, where's is Milo? Hello, Milo. How you doing, buddy? Uh, he seems happy. Okay. The, the dogs are actually not totally unrelated to one of the questions we got in office hours this week. You know, um, we talked about the modular theory of the mind, the modular model of the mind this week. And um, one of the questions was asked uh, by Karsten Kvist, Q-V-I-S-T, um, in relation to the modular theory of the mind and its evolutionary origin, it would seem to make sense to expect that similar modules exist across reasonably related species. Is there any research to support that? Um, well, my dogs have a barking at the mailman module, eating module, and so on. They also, but more seriously, they must have some sort of status-related equipment. There, there is clearly a hierarchy. You saw that Fraser had the choice spot there in the chair. That's the way the world works, and Milo accepts that. Although Milo does uh, challenge uh, Fraser sometimes to kind of semi-playful uh, fights um, in what may be a, an attempt to uh, unseat him, but Fraser usually handles them with, uh, with, with a kind of successful nonchalance. <laughs> Um, I want to get back, actually, in a more serious way to this question about animals and modules. But first, I want to say a bunch of other stuff about modules, because there was much talk of modules among students in the forum and on Facebook and on Twitter and so on. So, for example, Rui Gill, R-U-I, Gill, G-I-L, wrote in the discussion forum, the videos from this week's lectures have put me in a state of dukkha. To quote the great Buddhist Mick Jagger, they didn't get me no satisfaction. He says, um, I felt the explanatory power of the theory of modules a little unsatisfactory. Now, at first, I felt kind of guilty about, about filling Rui with uh, dukkha. But then I remembered, A, dukkha is a pervasive part of life, so, you know, don't blame me. B, the source, ultimately, according to the Four Noble Truths of Rui's dukkha, is actually his thirst for knowledge. So, really, if you would just surrender your thirst for knowledge, abandon the thirst for knowledge, you will not be unsatisfied with anything I say. Um, and ironically, you will attain enlightenment. No, but seriously, I owe Rui an answer. Rui's not the only one in the discussion forum who has doubts about the modular view of the mind. So, uh, and I'm gonna tackle a series of such challenges to the modular view of the mind. But first, let me talk about a couple of comments about the modular view of the mind that weren't challenges, as far as I could tell, unless there's a subtext that I missed. Um, and maybe there was, actually. Uh, uh, Paula Duval wrote in the discussion forum, she, she started a thread titled, What Mental Module Wrote Your Discussion Post? And yeah, come to think of it, that could be kind of like a little, little subtle ridicule of the model, right? Um, but I don't think so. I think it was, I think it was, uh, I think she comes in peace. Um, she, she writes, just asking myself and you, it's fascinating to think about. Um, it is fascinating to think about. I mean, the first thing I'd say is there must be, when you're posting in, in the uh, comment, in the, in the discussion form, there must be a module at play that we didn't even talk about, which is like a language generation module, right? Um, the, uh, you know, the, these kind of, some of these strictly, a lot of these strictly cognitive modules we didn't, we didn't talk much about. There's got to be that. But then there is the question, what do you say with your language module? What, what do you express in the discussion forum? And here I think we do get uh, to some of those kinds of modules that were laid out in the one modular theory that, that we kind of used as an example of a modular theory. Uh, the, the, the one, uh, the, uh, the, the seven sub-selves posited by Doug Kenrick and his, and his co-author. And in fact, 
Paula elicited a reply that drew on that model. Um, Jennifer Hawkins replied to Paula saying, um, my guess is either affiliation or status, either the, the affiliation module or the status module. By participating, you know, in the discussion forum, you get a little happiness spike associated with any social interaction. Um, she said the forums also give people a chance to show off, in quotes, what they know. Um, that's true. I think, um, uh, I think either of those modules could get triggered in the discussion forum, and it's actually an example of the point of this particular model, which is that, you know, information comes in into the environment and, and kind of determines which module gets triggered. In this case, it would depend on what the post you're reading says, right? I mean, if you see a post that, that agrees with your view and even endorses a view you've expressed in the forum, then you're like, oh, an ally. You're probably going to say nice things. Uh, that's, yeah, it's all about affiliation. On the other hand, um, if someone uh, challenges, and even, you know, especially if they kind of belittle something you've said on the forum, well, that's a threat to your status, right? And that's a, that, that elicits a whole different way of conceiving of the person who wrote the post and a whole different kind of response. Because then you've got to figure out a way to undermine their credibility and restore your credibility, right? And I don't mean you consciously think this. That's the interesting thing about modules, right? It works so much more subtly than that. It's like someone challenges you. And, and you know, yeah, if you pay attention, you can feel the kind of antagonistic feeling that's welling up. But what you may not realize is that then you will immediately start looking at their, their argument, you know, for holes that you can exploit in replying, right? They're, they must be wrong. They're challenging me. They must be wrong. Whereas... This person, if the other person who endorsed your views, you know, you're probably not going to be so picky, right? Like, you may read why it is they're endorsing your views. And if you think they got some things wrong, well, hey, that's forgivable, right? Um, and, and, I mean, we don't necessarily think about this, but that is the way, that's just a good example of how triggering one module or another, like, steers your subsequent kind of cognitive activity, right? Are you or are you not going to really assiduously analyze this person's argument? for a logical flaw and then convince yourself that it's a fatal logical flaw, right? Okay. Um, I also, uh, I want to say though, you know, that, that said, that I think this in a way bears out the module of view of the mind. It's also true, as I said, I think in the lecture, that things like this affiliation module, status module, they interact so fluidly, right? Like, so for example, somebody could endorse your view, but they do it in a kind of patronizing way. And so it's kind of like, wait, do they think... Like, they're better than me? I mean, is they think their status is higher than... I mean, this is a tricky situation, right? And, 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 and in general, the interaction between, you know, kind of status maintenance stuff and affiliation stuff is so kind of fluid that, you know, sometimes I think, you know, module is an unfortunate word because it gives... It, 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 it does convey this idea that these are like, you know, blocks, you know, and like, you know, whereas the whole... The real thing is much more fluid and continuous and so on. But anyway, that said, now let's get to uh, all those posts that were a threat to my status, right? I mean, we, these, ha these have to be dealt with, okay? People like Rui who, who doubted a modular theory of the mind that I think pretty highly of, um, and again, you know, the, 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 the one we trotted out was just a conversation starter. I don't, I don't like, I'm not endorsing the particular seven subselves or anything. You know, as I said, it's going to be super complicated if we ever get to the bottom of this. But um, some version of modular theory of the mind I have high hopes for. So it is a profound and grave threat to my status when students doubt it. I, and so my status module, you know, read that Rui's post, other posts, and like, it's like, what are we going to do about this? And here's the plan that my status module came up with. See what you think of this. Or actually, strictly speaking, it's, well, I don't know. Was, is, did my status module like steer some cognitive module in a direction and then turn the job over to it? I don't know. That's what I mean about how complicated this is. Anyway, here's the plan. I'm not going to argue that these people are wrong. I'm just going to argue that the models of the mind that they are positing as alternatives to the modular theory of the mind are not, in fact, incompatible with the modular theory of the mind. Okay? 
So that way, this is my status module thinking now, that way I can restore my status without undermining their status and then they'll, you know, then they'll be happy and won't, you know, there will be no round of counterattacks, presumably. But let's see if this works. You be the judge. Okay, let's start with Margot Warner, who said on Facebook, why can't we just convert the notion of modules into something simpler? Say that the brain has various parts which, which function in different ways. Margot, this may not surprise you given the preamble I just did, but I don't think that's compatible with a modular view, incom uh, incompatible with a modular view of the mind. Um, a modular view of the mind does say that the brain has various parts which function in different ways, but um, that alone uh, could imply a number of alternative models of which the modular view that I trotted out is only one. So, for example, what you said here, various parts function in different ways, that could be a very top-down CEO diagram, right? Like an actual corporation with a CEO, that's the conscious mind. It always consciously allocates tasks to the different functionally specialized modules. That would be one kind of model consistent with what you've said. But I think the modular view is another kind. It does say that the brain has various parts which function in different ways, but it says it's a more kind of decentralized um, system. Uh, I, I want to make sure and that I'm in focus when I restore my status to its rightful place. Okay. I think I'm in focus now. Where was I? Um, oh, module view is kind of... It, 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 the key things are it's, it's decentralized and in the sense that the, 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 the determination of which module is kind of running the show for a while is not generally consciously determined, okay? Okay. <clears throat> now on to Chris, that's two S's, Pagani, who wrote, I believe on Facebook, the modular, uh, the modular view is interesting, but couldn't the examples given be better explained by neurobiology? Now, first of all, I want to emphasize the modular, any modular view of the mind, we assume will someday be explained neurobiologically. It's not an alternative to a neurobiological model. So, Chris, we're on the same page. Uh, we both we both assume that the explanation is going to be at the neurobiological level. Now, Chris goes on to say, an example such as the person coming at you with a machete, stimulus from the visual sense activates the limbic system. That's associated with, like, you know, feelings and, and, and stuff, um, which activates flight or fight response and so on, all very explicable through these well-known processes with very specific specialized portions of the brain without adding a layer of modules on top of them. Okay, so there's maybe the, the thing. We're not laying modules on top of the known physiology of the brain. We're saying that a given module consists of a particular way of orchestrating these known parts of the brain for a specific task. Um, and any given part of the brain may be orchestrate, may, may be involved in a number of different modules, right? So, uh, a kind of example is, um, you know, the, you mentioned fight or flight. And, and Milo is fleeing right now. I don't know if you can see him, but that was Milo. Milo is fleeing. Milo's not really buying the, uh, the modular model of the mind, apparently. He's had enough. Frazier? Frazier is his usual responsive self. Hi, Frazier. Um, they may sense a threat downstairs, but it's Sunday, so it's not, it's not the mailman. So, but I want to emphasize that... Um, well, I think it's illuminating to look at this particular example, okay? So, how about we just say limbic system, flight or fight response, we knew about that stuff, um, fine, I, right, those could be involved in what Kenrick calls the self-protection module, but I want to emphasize that Kenrick is talking about self-protection um, from humans, and sometimes when you're dealing with humans, it's more complicated than fight or flight, right? It's like 
sometimes, okay, they may be ready to kill you, but maybe if you give them some money, they won't. Or maybe if you apologize, they won't. So it's more than fight or flight. You, you, you've, um, there may be, you know, negotiation, talking. That is going to mean that you're going to have to use the theory of mind module. Remember the module that helps you infer what people are thinking, try to figure out what's actually going on in their head. So that's going to, so when the threat comes from a human, um, that may well get triggered. And, and I, we saw a brain scan of the theory of mind kind of network or module um, in, the, in the last lecture, which is evidence that, yes, we're talking about neurobiology, we're talking about physiology, uh, but you may have noticed that even the theory of mind module was itself drawing on different parts of the brain. So, um, so anyway, yes, it, it's neurobiological, but, uh, you know, and modules aren't like whole blocks being added that I'm claiming are on top of the stuff we already knew about. Um, modules consist in distinctive, um, you know, patterns of orchestrating different parts of the mind. And it's because evolution is so kind of thrifty um, that a lot of these parts of the brain are going to be used in more than one, um, in more than one module. So, for example... Um, you know, oxytocin is a chemical that we know bonds uh, mothers to infants right after birth. Uh, oxytocin also is involved in cementing the bonds of friendship, apparently, uh, and in trust generally in a, in a social context. Well, w we know that m maternity preceded the, the friendship in our species by a long, long time, okay? Um, friendship is reciprocal altruism. Well, that, that came along much more recently than, than maternity, but when, you know, and, and that would come under the general heading of what Kendrick calls the affiliation module, presumably, you know, friendship, reciprocal altruism, but it drew on pre-existing stuff, this oxytocin that has this, this um, bonding effect. It may modulate it differently and so on, but, but you know, that modules are, anyway, I, maybe I've made my point. Maybe I haven't. Anyway, next, on to Marjorie Forbes, who said in the discussion forum, I cannot see how we got from delusions about ourselves, that was the title of the first segment, I think, of that lecture, to this rather obscure module of view of the mind. She says, um, well, she mentions this alternative model of um, Daniel Dennett's, which is called the fame in the brain hypothesis. I don't, I'm not that conversant with it. She says, he, he says, then it says that in our heads there's a turmoil going, going on. A turmoil going on. There's many different elements vying for attention. Something always wins, and the ones that win are the ones that we are conscious of. Um, actually, that sounds like a modular theory of the mind. It certainly could be. Now, now, as he fleshed it out, I might say, well, that's a little different, but that's the modular mind, the modular, the standard, the common modular models of the mind imagine something like that going on. Now, um, here earlier in Marjorie's post, there's something that may explain why she thinks Dan it, uh, Dennett's theory is different. She says, no one knows what consciousness is yet, but there are other hypotheses other than the modular view of the mind that explain the issues raised in the first segment more simply, the first segment being about um, delusions about ourselves, and therefore more consistently with the principle of lightness. Uh, well, or she means Occam's razor, she says. Um, I just want to be clear. I'm not sure she's presupposing this, but the modular view doesn't purport to explain consciousness in, in some kind of metaphysical sense, right? I mean, the, it doesn't mean to address the most challenging question about consciousness, like what is it, why does it exist? Um, I know Dennett thinks he has an explanation. Just between you and me, he doesn't. But he, I know that is on his agenda, and maybe that's why um, she saw what actually sounds like a modular view of the mind um, as, uh, as different from modular view of the mind. Uh, I don't know. But in any event, I want to emphasize, this is not about explaining consciousness in the philosophical sense. It's not, that's not what the modular view of the mind is for. So some, another comment I know said, well, why don't we use com complexity theory, which explains like emergent properties like consciousness or something like we're not trying to explain consciousness here. We're, we're trying to explain, given that, well, we're trying to explain a lot of things. One of them is given that the conscious mind 
seems not to have a clear idea of what is actually going on, well, what is actually going on? You know, there's various ways you could explain a system where the conscious mind doesn't get the full picture. Modular model is one of those um, explanations. Okay, now we get back to Rui Gill. Now, here's my chance for revenge. Remember, Rui is the, the troublemaker here. Um, and so I'm going to have to do whatever is necessary. All, by any means necessary, I will defend my status. Rui says he prefers, rather than a module view of the mind, he would like us to adopt Gregory Bateson's thing. <laughs> okay. I, j I think this is another example, Gregory Bateson's kind of view of the mind. I think this is another example of something that, you know, remember my general agenda here is take, take things that people say are um, inconsistent with a module view of the mind, argue that they're not. I think this is, I think Bateson is not. Now, I, 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 I read the book Mind and Nature like, oh, literally 33 years ago. I have almost no recollection. But I think both by perusing quickly Rui's recapitulation of Bateson and, and based also on my memory of it, you know, I just remember Bateson emphasizing the interaction the, the, between us and other um, organisms in the world generally, the, 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 the feedback loops of information being so pervasive that, that you yeah, kind of had to think of it as a whole system. And by the way, that's actually a very Buddhist way to think of it. Um, but you can think of a modular view of the mind that way. You can think of any, any model of the mind that way. I think it, it's just a, it, it's, um, you, you can take any account of what's going on in the mind internally, I think, and plug it into Bateson's view that uh, there's this larger cybernetic system we're part of. But maybe I'm wrong. I may be straining here to hold up my status, and I may fail. Um, okay, so enough of things that purport to be alternatives, but I think aren't. Doug Caro mentions uh, Marvin Minsky's book, Society of Mind, and, 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 and Doug says, this is on the discussion forum, says, from my faulty, in parentheses, memory of the material, I suspect it's a higher level of abstract, it's, I suspect it's higher level of abstraction will be a more useful model than modules, but there may be very little difference between the two. I think the latter. I think there's very, I think Minsky's model is an example of a modular view. It's a very good, entertaining book, by the way. There's like no chapter longer than about a page. You know, it's just, it's a big, it's almost like a coffee table book. And worth tracking down. Minsky was very smart. But I know that Rob um, Kurzban, um, who showed up in, in a couple of lectures and is, of course, a primary proponent of the modular view of the mind, was a student of Lita Cos Cosmides, who's another primary uh, proponent is a big fan of this book. So Rob thinks it's like totally modular. The book itself is actually modular in structure, but that's... Um, speaking of other thinkers who may or may not be related to this, Wu Sulan asks, um, I wanted to ask if the bundle theory of the mind from Hume directly affected the development of the modular idea of the mind. I don't know the bundle theory of the mind very well. I do know that um, Hume uh, is a fascinating thinker. Of course, you know, Scottish Enlightenment philosopher. Um, and very Buddhist. He has an argument against the existence of the self that is structurally very much like the Buddhist argument against the self. So much so that scholars have uh, speculated on whether he actually encountered Buddhist thought via his encounters with Jesuits who had been to China or something or somewhere in Asia. Hume is worth. He's Buddhist in a number of ways. Um, I mean, without being explicitly Buddhist, but the nature of his worldview. Uh, um, so, you know, I, I again want to emphasize on modules. The, the Kendrick model is just a conversation starter. I'm, uh, you know, I think uh, when we get to the bottom of, of uh, modules, um, it's all going to be pretty darn complicated. Yeah. And, you know, at some level, you know, I think the term module has to be an oversimplification in a way. Uh, but that's almost, you know, I think a, a good Buddhist would say that's true of lots of things you say about the world, right? That 
ultimately these things we think of as things are all kind of processes. There's, there, it's like all very fluid. We put these, we use these nouns, but everything is a process in flux. I think there's some truth to that. And I, and I think, you know, the point where like, you take status and, and affiliation. It's like, you know, the point where one hands the ball off, hands the torch off to the other one. It's like, is it, you know, is it so clear always? Or is it more like, you know, thinking of like kind of networks that, you know, kind of move around, networks of activation that move around and sometimes merge and sometimes are kind of semi-merged. I don't know. I think the key thing um, for our purposes or one um, key thing is that this is a model where things in the environment, often in the environment, although as we'll see in the lecture we haven't already seen, I think it's going to be posted this Thursday, there's other ways modules can get activated. But anyway, we shift from module to module without consciously deciding to do it. We shift from emphasis to emphasis. Oh, I'm in friend-making mode now. I'm evaluating this person as a friend. I'm giving them the benefit of the doubt to like enemy mode, to various modes. Um, often without really thinking about it, it fundamentally alters our view of reality. And I would argue that this, you know, it's very rare that actually we're seeing the true view. We're always coloring the view in one way or another. It kind of happens unconsciously without our awareness. And in this lecture that's going to be posted on Thursday, we will get into the, um, get more into the connection between mindfulness meditation and this, how mindfulness meditation uh, relates to, to all this. Um, I think there's a few more things I wanted to get into, but since I don't see the questions right here, I think I should turn off the camera. I'll be right back. Okay, I wanted to get back to this question from Karsten Kvist about whether there's evidence of uh, modules in species closely related to us. Um, I, I'm not aware of much evidence of modules per se. However, I think it's interesting to look at the behavioral parallels between humans and chimpanzees who are very closely related to us. Um, as closely related as any species. You know, they, chimps, uh, they, they have what you might call friendship, you know, alliances, reciprocal altruism. Um, and they, you know, they swap favors with their, their friends, their allies. They also pursue status, and, and that has great consequences. And in fact, the alliances uh, themselves, the coalitions, are used uh, in the pursuit of status. So it's a pretty complex behavioral repertoire with some apparent parallels with um, human behavior. Now, um, you know, and, and you would certainly, you would certainly assume that there's, you know, some functional specialization in the brain governing uh, these, these behaviors, right? I, I, I don't think these things are all like cultural inventions on the part of chimpanzees, right? Just invented the, the institution of friendship. Um, now, I want to emphasize, we are not descended from chimpanzees, okay? These are not our ancestors. Rather, we share, we both descended from a common ancestor, um, and so did bonobos. They are as closely related to us as chimpanzees, and they are in some ways different from chimpanzees, and that's a caution against inferring too much about what this common ancestor of all three of us was like. We just don't know. At the same time, um, I do think, uh, if you look at, at chimps, it's a, it's a pretty good guess um, that, uh, you know, in our lineage, you know, whatever our ancestors were like, it's a pretty good guess that um, this functional specialization in the brain governing things like friendship, the pursuit of status, and the interaction between the two um, probably started evolving uh, quite a while before we were capable of really complex reasoning, before we were capable of complex language, before we were doing much in the way of conscious reflection. And, you know, that may um, help explain uh, certain features about the relationship of consciousness to, um, the, 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 uh, to these modules and how much of the motivation is and is not conscious and so on. Um, but in any event, uh, I think it also illustrates that, you know, just in a certain sense, I mean, modules, at least taken broadly to mean functional specialization in the brain to coordinate certain kinds of activities, um, almost cannot help 
you know, but have evolved, right? I mean, it, it, it's just, if you really take natural selection seriously, uh, and you realize that in our lineage, we, you know, encountered uh, different challenges at different times, and evolved responses to those challenges, it's just kind of hard to imagine that something like modules didn't, in some sense, kind of, you know, pile up. Uh, which isn't to say that 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 uh, the theories we've been talking about <clears throat> are are you know exactly on target or that we've figured out exactly you know how the modules are orchestrated or anything else. But modules per se, I think, are are a, a likely outcome of evolution. Um, Margot Warner just quickly asks: uh, the theory of modules seems deterministic. Does it leave any room for free will and responsibility for our actions? Well, I would just say briefly and cryptically, I would say it leaves no more room and no less room um, than other psychological theories. I mean, psychological theories tend to be kind of deterministic on paper because uh, they, you know, purport to come up with mechanisms that explain things mechanistically. But, you know, I, free will, to me, it's just all a mystery. I am agnostic on the question of free will and determinism. Um, I think the human mind is really incapable of grappling successfully with that question. And why would it be capable? We didn't evolve to be philosophers, right? Uh, I think there's a lot about, uh, there are things we just may have trouble comprehending. Consciousness may be another one, and that may be related to um, free will. Okay, another kind of free will related uh, thing, Fritz Kreisler, or Kreisler, says, can't wait to hear how meditation impacts the modular mind without choice, in quotes, entering into it. Okay, so this is in anticipation of the lecture that will be, will air this week. Um, and it's a prescient anticipation because that choice does kind of come up. I don't address it all that, that explicitly. I mean, I don't, I don't address the free will question all that explicitly, but it certainly is a case that one thing this lecture is about is how we can use meditation to influence which modules um, are in charge. Uh, Fritz also says, I hope this course is the core, inspir core or inspiration for your next book. I actually am working on a book that's very much related to the course. Um, and that's one reason that, uh, you know, it's valuable to get all of this feedback. Uh, you know, it, it can help me, you know, rethink how to, how to uh, frame things, how to explain things. You know, am I explaining them successfully? Sometimes gets me to rethink the ideas themselves, you know. Um, certainly... Uh, in the case of this lecture, the feedback has made me wish I had emphasized more than I did that, you know, the kind of seven sub-self model that's in this one particular book I cited, that's just a conversation starter. I think it's a, it's a reasonable way to think about the taxonomy of modules. In other words, in the realm of affiliation, say, yeah, there must be some modules. Whether that means there's an affiliation module per se is another question. Um, you know, and... Uh, so it is all very complicated. I tried to emphasize that in the lecture. I want to reiterate it by way of addressing the various, um, you know, valid forms of skepticism about the model that have um, emerged. So uh, thank you all um, for this. Uh, thank you, Rui, who started it all off. I'm sorry about your dukkha, Rui, but, you know, that's life. Um, and... Uh, I will see you next office hours, about a week from now. Um, and also then in this week's lecture, a couple days from now, a few days from now. Um, and believe it or not, that's the second to last lecture. So you don't have long to wait until you attain uh, nirvana. See you next time.